Today, we'll be discussing socialization. Socialization is the process by which people are taught to be proficient members of a society. It describes the way that people come to understand social norms, expectations, to accept society's beliefs, and to be aware of societal values. Socialization is not the same as socializing. And to be precise, socialization is a sociological process that occurs through the act of socializing. I want you to think about when we're born. We have a genetic makeup and we have biological traits. However, who we are as human beings develops through social interaction. In other words, our sense of self and our sense of self-development is not innate, meaning that we're not born with it. We learn it by socializing with other human beings around us. Charles Cooley, one of the leading contributors to the development of the sociological perspective, if you recall, entering each new scenario, each new situation as a blank canvas with the beginner's mind. Well, Cooley argues that a person's self-understanding is constructed in part by the perception of how others view them. In other words, this looking glass self, which we talked about in the previous chapter, this idea that our understanding of self is largely derived from how we believe people perceive us to be. And the idea that our interactions with others reflect that of a mirror, that we start to adjust our behaviors and our attitudes so that we appear favorable in the eyes of others. Then we look at George Herbert Mead. And George Herbert Mead says, well, when it comes to self, a person's distinct identity is largely developed by social interaction. So pretty much consistent with what we've said so far. That individuals also, similar to the looking glass self, have to be able to view himself or herself through the eyes of the other. That we have to put ourselves in someone else's shoes. That we have to develop the state of self-awareness. That we have to look at ourselves from the perspective of the other. Further illustrating the importance of the looking glass self. But Mead goes a step further. And in 1934, he argues that the process of being a newborn to a human being with a sense of self occurs through a specific path of development that we all go through. He calls this the imitation stage, the play stage, and the game stage. So we start off in the preparatory stage. And at this stage, children are only capable of, initiate, of imitation. They don't have the cognitive ability to imagine how others see things. So instead, they copy the actions of those that they regularly interact with, such as their mothers and fathers. They pretend to shave. They may change their voice. They may dress a certain way. They may interact with others in a particular manner. Then we cross over to the play stage. And in play stage, children begin to take the role that another person may have. They might try a parent's point of view by acting as a grown-up. Now starting to understand the meaning of dressing up. Now they're acting out the role of mom or dad. Now they're talking on their cell phones to mimic the behaviors of their parents during a phone conversation. And then in the third stage, we have the game stage. And that's where children begin to learn several roles that can exist at the same time and how those roles interact with one another. There's a degree of complexity here. There's a degree of chaos. If you've ever seen kids play basketball or soccer, you know that typically they don't maintain their position. They're running in any direction that the ball goes. Well, the same thing here. As kids begin to grow, as they become uh, more mature, they begin to, a to be able to settle down into particular roles, even though there is an onslaught of multiple roles and expectations being tossed at them at one time. So after we complete the three stages of the imitation play and game stage, then children to begin to develop an understanding of the generalized other. And the generalized other is essentially these common behavioral expectations of general society. Right? How people force upon us certain expectations of how we're going to act, how we're going to behave, oftentimes based on a gender, 
based on our age, based on our race, ethnicity, based on our social class. These expectations, these behavioral expectations that others place upon us largely shape our interactions and our understanding of self. Then we look at Kohlberg's theory of moral development. And Kohlberg argues that moral development is, plays a key role in the socialization process. That people begin to understand through society what is good and what is bad. And what is good and what is bad, primarily what is good, contributes to the smooth functioning of society, structural functionalism. And that moral development prevents people from acting on unchecked urges. Because they think about the consequences. They think about what is right and what is good for others. Kohlberg in 1981 argues that the process of how people learn to decide between what is right and what is wrong is based on three levels, the pre-conventional level, the conventional level, and the post-conventional level. In the pre-conventional stage, children, once again, lack a higher level of cognitive ability. So they experience the world around them only through their senses. And then as they enter their teen years, they develop what he considers to be conventional theory that children become aware of the feelings of others. And they take those into consideration when determining whether or not something's good or something's bad. And in the post-conventional stage, people begin to think of morality in abstract terms, such as Americans thinking about the fact that everyone has the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. At the post-conventional stage, people also recognize the legality and the morality of things don't necessarily always match up. <clears throat> that things can be legal, but not ethical. Things can be legal, but not moral. Slavery was legal, but slavery is immoral and unethical. We think of Gilligan and Gilligan's theory of moral development and gender. And Gilligan focused on morality as it pertains to boys and girls. And he wanted to understand the differences in morality. And Gilligan found that boys tend to focus on the justice perspective, placing a greater emphasis on rules and laws. And girls have a tendency to show more care and responsibility and adopt that perspective. They tend to consider the reasons why people engage in behavior that seems morally wrong. Gilligan theorized that boys are socialized for a work environment where rules make operations run smoothly while girls are socialized for a home environment where flexibility allows for harmony and caretaking and nurturing. We understand why socialization matters. Socialization matters because it's critical to, bar, to individuals and to societies that we live or that they live in. That socialization is intertwined into human beings and the social world. How we teach culture to individuals perpetuates itself through society. That if new generations of society don't learn the way, the specific way of life taught through culture, well, that generation can, or that society can cease to exist. That we transmit culture in order to survive. That it is essential to us as individuals. That social interaction provides the means via which we gradually become able to see ourselves through the eyes of others. And how we learn who we are and how we fit into the social world. We learn how to be functional members of society, how we dress, how we behave, what we eat and prepare for dinner. We begin to learn language and dominant language and the dominant meaning of symbols and language, which largely shape how we communicate with others. Then we go down this road of nature versus nurture. This idea that who we are at times can be the result of nurture. Meaning, we are influenced by relationships and those that care for us and surround us. While others may argue that our sense of who we are is derived from genetics, our temperaments, our interests, our talents, they argue that are set at birth. And we focus more on nature as opposed to nurture. Now, that's up for debate. As sociologists, we understand that socialization is an essential component of society because it trains individuals to be successful and contributing members of society, that it perpetuates culture by transmitting it from one generation to the next, therefore contributing to a smooth function of society, therefore illustrating the concepts of structural functionalism. 
And then we look at conflict theorists and conflict theorists say, hold up the socialization process. Well, that reproduces inequities and inequalities from one generation to the next. That people are socialized differently along the lines of gender and race and social class. And then we look at the symbolic interactionist perspective. That studying socialization leads us to focus and to be concerned about face-to-face -face exchanges and symbolic communication. The fact that some individuals choose to choose dress their boys in blue and their girls in pink, which convey messages about gender roles and gender role expectations. Then we look at social group agents. And these are experiences with socialization, our peers, our family, the education system, the workforce, religion, all of these shape who we become. And we think about the family as the first experience of socialization. The idea that families show kids how to use objects from the stove to how to wear clothes to using computers, how to use utensils, how to read books. How do we begin to relate to others who's family and who's friends and who are strangers? We begin to understand how the real world works as opposed to the ideal world. The socialization includes teaching and learning about an unending array of objects and ideas that are taught to us through the family. That the family doesn't socialize us in a vacuum. That there are a number of forces that influence us and we think about the concept of intersectionality, the impact of our social class, of our race, of our ethnicity, of our gender, of our gender identity, of our sexual orientation, and so on and so forth, and how all those factors begin to influence our life experiences and our life's trajectory. The idea that we have a sociological imagination that says, here are your personal troubles and here are large social issues contributing to those personal troubles. The idea that families can socialize kids into a particular social class at times. That kids may be socialized in a working class family to simply go to work as opposed to pursuing an education because we need to make money now. As opposed to kids in wealthier families or in upper class families where kids may receive better opportunities when it comes to education, they may gain that exposure to managerial roles right, which help elevate them. They have this cultural knowledge that is not afforded to everyone, especially those of poor and working class families. <laughs> Our peer groups on the playground and at school largely shape what our interests are. Our sense of self. This idea that we engage in activities with peers that we may not engage in activities or behaviors with our family and close friends. That we begin to rank friendships and we compare those friendships to what we've been taught from our family. We think about social institutions, formal institutions like schools, the workplace, the government, and how we are taught to behave and navigate these systems. We other understand that other institutions exist as well as the media, for example, that shape our behavior. Well, let's think about schools. Kids are typically in school for seven hours a day, 180 days a year. In school, they not only learn math, reading, and science, the manifest functions. They also learn latent functions, such as how to socialize, how to participate in teamwork, how to follow schedule, how to use textbooks how to be more independent and responsible for their behaviors and activities. The idea that in school environments, classroom rituals lead kids to behave in certain behavior, to, to engage in certain behaviors. That teachers can serve as role models and, and leaders, and they can constantly reinforce what society expects of children. This idea that Schools may be engaged in the hidden curriculum, the informal teaching that takes place in schools. This idea that we learn how to deal with bureaucracies and rules and expectations and the importance of waiting our turn and being patient. All of these factors within the hidden curriculum contribute to our ability to function well in society. 
Schools socialize us to be citizens, to have national pride. In many schools, we have the American flag in our classrooms. We recite the Pledge of Allegiance in the morning. My son goes to a Catholic school, and not only do they recite the Pledge of Allegiance, but they also say a prayer. The socialization of kids into religion. You think about how history is taught, how different cultures are taught. An understanding of diversity and a valuing of diversity is taught in schools, some school districts, and ignored by others. Well, that largely shapes a child's socialization process. <clears throat> we think about the workplace. And we think about how we're socialized to show up on time, to do our job, and to do a good quality perform, to have a good quality performance. The idea that today trends have been established where individuals are not married to one job for their entire life. In fact, people bounce around jobs. And even when people have a college degree in one area, many individuals are working in careers that are the complete opposite of the area that they majored in. You look at religion <clears throat> and the meaning that religion provides and the religious celebrations that we're engaged in. The idea that religion can uphold gender norms and contribute to the enforcement of rules and sanctions. That at times religions reinforce a passage, a rite of passage, a ceremonial rite of passage that can reinforce the family unit that can reinforce gender roles, that can reinforce the societal values that have been established. We look at the government and laws that are made. This idea that norms are established that say, at the age of 18, you are legally responsible for yourself. At the age of 65, you are considered old and may qualify for senior benefits. That Every new stage of life carries it with it a different category, from being a senior to being an adult to being a taxpayer, and so on and so forth. That there are different learning curves there. At the age of 18, males have to register for the selective service. Seniors have to learn the ropes of Medicare, Social Security benefits, and be aware of senior shopping discounts. And then we look at the mass media, television, newspaper, radio, the internet. And the average person spends around four hours a day consuming these different sources. And we think about how the media shapes our belief system, our value system, how the media begins to shape our expectations and norms. We think about how socialization is a lifelong process. And through the media, through the school, through the workplace, through our family, through our peers, it is constantly evolving. It is constantly changing. Our understanding of self and how we interact with others is constantly changing. How we behave in elementary school is different than middle school, middle school to high school, high school to college, college to the workforce. And with every new stage in life, we are socialized into new expectations, role expectations in particular. That every new role expectation brings with it its own challenges. That there are expectations that when you hit a certain age, you might want to buy a home. When you reach this age, you might want to get married. When you reach this age, you might want to have children. That we're taught that at some point, we have to focus on career. We have to focus on settling down. This idea that we're socialized into future roles in our lives by those significant others around us. They encourage us to be engineers and doctors and lawyers and teachers. That individuals socialize us into learning how to cook for ourselves, learning how to wash dishes, learning how to do laundry. That individuals teach us how to save for retirement, for example, how to choose a health care option. Then we look at the resocialization process. And the resocialization process is essentially this idea that we have a radical approach to our understanding of socialization, that we enter institutions that radically change our experience with socialization. And let me give you an example of that. You think about joining the military. 
You think about the prison experience. You have to be socialized into how to survive in prison and how prison functions. The same way you have to be socialized into military expectations. You have to unlearn your previous behaviors and learn a whole new set of behaviors, thereby being re-socialized. And that typically occurs by taking individuals out of their original element. We understand that with every new phase in life, we dismiss the old us. And we look at the revised or the renewed us. This idea that we look for support and people who are empathetic. We look for opportunities to exist that can lead us to further embracing our new identities as a result of socialization and re-socialization. This idea that we have to buy in to this new system, and as I mentioned before, share, shed our old identity. Thank you so much for your time. This concludes this lecture.